All right, class, so welcome to March. Here we are in Wednesday, March 2nd. So I'm just gonna take us through kind of what your syllabus has for today. Um, I try to go through this every time at the beginning of the class. Let me let in a couple more people. So as you know by now, we're a little bit behind in lecture. So here's Wednesday, March 2nd. Um, we're gonna try to get through some more of the nervous system today, but this lecture exam, just so that you guys know, um, the lecture exam will probably be pushed off at least for another week, um, so no worries there. I'll, I'll keep you posted when that lecture exam will be. Um, but what we are staying on top of are all the lab schedules. So if you're in section two with lab with me today on Wednesdays, you will have your second lab practical exam on exercises seven, eight, and nine. Um, and then Monday's group will have that on Monday. So keep that in mind. Um, in a couple of weeks, we'll have a spring break. So you guys will get a week off, which will be nice. Um, but just so you know, again, a reminder that this lecture exam coming up on Monday will be pushed off um, at least for a week, maybe a longer. Any questions about any of that? If not, we'll jump right into more nervous system talk as I let some more people in. All right, and if you're just getting in, no lecture exam on Monday. We're we haven't gotten through all the material yet, but if you're in Wednesday's lab, you will have a lab practical today, your second one. And then Monday, keep that in mind for lab, you'll have your second lab exam. And again, that lab exam is on exercises seven, eight, and nine. Okay, so let's go ahead and share kind of where we left off on Monday. Um, let me pull up one second here. Okay, so here we are where we left off on kind of part one of chapter eight, which is kind of, we divide chapter eight into two parts because it's very lengthy on the nervous system. And we're gonna finish part one and we'll try to get through the end of part two, but part two is pretty, pretty lengthy as well. Um, when we talk about a synapse, a synapse is any junction or a connection uh, between a nerve and a muscle cell. And in our case, we're talking about a neuron neuronal synapse. So this will be the synapse or connection between one neuron and how it connects or interacts with another neuron. And the end of the axon will form what we call a presynaptic terminal. And the membrane of the next neuron forms the postsynaptic membrane with the synaptic cleft is the space between the two. We have chemical substances called neurotransmitters that are stored in the synaptic vesicles in the presynaptic terminal. And as we remember from your muscle system talk, those uh, 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 neurotransmitters will eventually be released to cross over the synaptic cleft to bind to receptor molecules on the postsynaptic membrane. So a little bit more about the physiology behind the synapse and action potential will reach the first neuron, so the presynaptic terminal, and that will cause voltage-gated calcium channels to open, calcium rushes into the cell, and that influx of calcium into the first neuron causes the release of your neurotransmitters. And the neurotransmitters will be the important chemical messengers that cross over the synapse or the synaptic cleft to bind to the receptor molecules on the postsynaptic membrane of your second neuron. And that's how two neurons can communicate with each other and send the signal from one neuron down to the next. The binding of these neurotransmitters then to that second neuron membrane causes more gated channels to open, usually sodium, potassium, or chloride, um, to open or close. And the specific channel type and whether or not the channel opens or closes depends on the type of neurotransmitter and the type of receptor. The response can either stimulate a response, so keep kind of the signal moving down that second neuron, or it can actually inhibit the action potential. So that signal would kind of stop with that neuron. If sodium channels opens, the postsynaptic cell, that's the second cell, becomes depolarized and an action potential will result if threshold is reached. And if potassium or chloride channels opens, that usually makes the inside of the cell more negative or hyperpolarized. So that would inhibit an action potential from occurring. We have lots of different neurotransmitters um, in your body, but we focus on, and kind of the best known are acetylcholine and norepinephrine. 
They, these neurotransmitters don't remain in your synaptic cleft forever because if they would, they would constantly be stimulating or inhibiting that second neuron. So their effects are very short lived and they are controlled or the concentration of the neurotransmitters are controlled by being broken down by different enzymes or they're actually kind of transported back in to the first neuron, the presynaptic cleft where they came from. A specific enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine is called acetyl, acetylcholine esterase. And whenever you see the ending erase, that usually means it's an enzyme. And norepinephrine will be transported back into the first neuron, or it will be broken down by different enzymes as well. So here's the synapse, which again is the junction between two neurons that are trying to communicate with each other. And um, the steps shown here take you through in a really simplified way what happens and how these neurons communicate with each other. An action potential causes calcium to enter the cell. Calcium entering into the cell causes neurotransmitters to be released as they travel across the synaptic cleft. They will bind to um, receptors on the postsynaptic membrane as shown here. And the binding of those neurotransmitters on the second neuron opens more channels. And usually if sodium channels are open, then sodium rushes into the cell and that will stimulate an action potential in the second neuron. A reflex has to do with this kind of connection in synapse because it's an involuntary reaction in response to a stimulus applied to the periphery and transmitted to the central nervous system. And reflexes are very important because they allow us to react to stimuli more quickly than is possible if conscious thought is involved. So a reflex, you know, think of your doctor hitting the patellar tendon on your knee or the idea of you removing your hand from a hot stove, that is a reflex that happens automatically and incredibly fast. So most reflexes actually just occur in the spinal cord and they don't travel up to your brain at all to get that motor response of kicking your leg out when the doctor hammers your knee or removing your hand from a hot stove. So your brain isn't even involved with that. The reflex kind of goes in and out of the spinal cord. Your brain eventually finds out what's happening, um, but the initial act of the reflex um, is not processed by the brain. We label a reflex arc as the neuronal pathway, and it has five basic components, which you should know. The sensory receptor, which senses the stimulus, whether that's pain, touch, uh, the rubber hammer, a sensory neuron, an interneuron, which will be located between the communication of the two, and then a motor neuron, which will bring out an, an effector or a response to an organ like your muscles and gland. Uh, the simplest reflex arcs don't even involve an interneuron. They'll just go right from a sensory neuron to a motor neuron to get the quickest and fastest reflex possible. So let's look at an example of a sensory receptor in your skin. Let's say this is a sensory receptor for pain or temperature and you touch a hot stove or your kid touch, touches a hot stove. That sensory stimulus travels through the sensory neuron, through a ganglion, and then sometimes paths passing through an interneuron in the spinal cord, um, but it doesn't go up to the brain. And then the motor neuron brings out a response that usually will stimulus a gland, gland or a muscle. And in this case, it's an effector organ, it's a skeletal muscle. And literally the second you touch a hot stove, your spinal cord has sent out a motor response for you to remove your hand from that painful stimulus. So these are the five components of a reflex arc. And again, this is an important part of your body because this is a way for your body to protect itself. Um, and to kind of get out of harm's way if something puts you in danger. The neuronal pathway, we call it converging. Your central nervous system has simple to complex what we call neuronal pathways. A converging pathway is a simple pathway in which two or more neurons kind of synapse with the same postsynaptic neurons. So we have kind of two neurons coming in and they will kind of connect to one. So that's called a converging pathway. And this allows information to be transmitted from more than one neuronal pathway and converging onto a single pathway. So that's called a converging pathway. 
A diverging pathway, in contrast to that, is a simple pathway in which one neuron will divide and synapse with more than one other postsynaptic neuron. And this allows information in one neuronal pathway to diverge and be passed along to two or more pathways. And these kind of convergent and divergent pathways um, are very important in the body. So here is showing the direction of an action potential on a, um, a converging pathway, because these two neurons in gray are converging on one um, neuron. And then here is a look at a divergent pathway. So you have one neuron in green diverging and sending its signal to two neurons in gray. Uh, we'll kind of finish here talking about summation. A single presynaptic action potential usually does not cause a sufficiently, sufficiently large enough postsynaptic local potential to reach threshold to produce an action potential. So many of our presynaptic action potentials are needed in a process called summation. And summation it kind of summates or adds all the signals in a neuronal pathway together to allow the integration of multiple subthreshold local potentials to try to bring the membrane potential to an action potential. We can have spatial summation, which occurs when local potentials originate from different locations, for example, from a converging pathway, and temporal summation occurs when local potentials overlap in time. And this can occur if a single input keeps firing rapidly, which allows your local potentials to overlap briefly. Um, both types of summation can lead to a stimulatory effect or an inhibitory effect, depending on the type of signal. And that takes us through part one of chapter eight in the nervous system. I know this is a lot of information. I'm going to pull up part two, and we're just going to kind of keep jumping right through your nervous system. Um, so here we have part two of chapter eight, the nervous system. And we'll see how far we get through. So part two, I know this is meaty, heavy stuff, um, but eventually we'll get through it. So this kind of just takes us through basic organization of the nervous system. Part one was a little bit about how your nervous system kind of functions, how it sends off signals and action potentials. And part two is going to take us through a little more basic anatomy. So hopefully this part two is a little easier to take in and process. So we divide our nervous system into a central nervous system, which consists of your brain and spinal cord. And from here on out, I might abbreviate the central nervous system as CNS. And then the peripheral nervous system consists of all the nerves, whether they're spinal nerves, cranial nerves, all the ganglia, which are clusters of neuron cell bodies outside of the brain and spinal cord. So that's your PNS. Here is the spinal cord itself and how it comes down from the brain. Um, it extends from the foramen magnum, which is the hole that it passes through from the brain to the second lumbar vertebra. And you can see that here, kind of this area is kind of the end of the spinal cord. It's protected by your vertebral column. So your spinal cord travels through all the vertebra that stack up on each other. And spinal nerves come off the spinal cord as a part of your peripheral nervous system to allow for movement and control of your body. Um, if your spinal cord is damaged, paralysis can occur. And depending on where that damage occurs, let's say you're um, in an accident and the spinal cord was severed, you know, maybe this is your T12 vertebra. Um, unfortunately, your nervous system doesn't have the process to regenerate and regrow back. So if your spinal cord is severed or if you have a spinal cord injury, um, you know, the connection from that brain will not get past that severing. So anything, you know, from this kind of line down, wherever the severing occurred, those parts of the body would be paralyzed. We can divide your nervous system into gray and white matter. We talked a little bit about why um, we have different colors of kind of tissue or matter in our nervous system. Gray matter is at the center of the spinal cord and it will look like the letter H or a butterfly. And white matter is outside of the spinal cord and it's white because its fibers are covered with myelin because myelin is white. 
the white matter in the spinal cord, um, we arrange it into different columns, the dorsal, which is the posterior side, the ventral is the anterior side, and the lateral is kind of on the lateral side of the spinal cord. And these columns that we've arranged the white matter in uh, contain ascending tracks to the brain of neurons and descending tracks from the brain to parts of the body. The ascending tracks are axons that conduct action potentials to the brain, and the descending tracks are axons that conduct action potentials away from the brain and back down. So that is how we arrange white matter in the spinal cord, and soon I have a picture for you. The gray matter looks like the letter H with different horns that we can label. Posterior or dorsal horns contain axons which synapse with interneurons. Anterior horns contain somatic neurons, which will uh, remember somatic are skeletal muscle control neurons. And then the lateral horns contain autonomic neurons. And remember autonomic functions are those functions that happen subconsciously, automatically. The central canal is a fluid-filled space in the center of your cord that's filled with cerebral spinal fluid. So here we have a very typical picture of a spinal cord cross-section, looking at how the gray matter kind of makes this nice butterfly or H-shaped structure. So this is gray matter. And we divide the gray matter into a posterior, lateral, and anterior horn. And then we divide your white matter, which surrounds that, into a dorsal, ventral, and lateral column. If you're wondering which side of the spinal cord is the anterior side and the posterior side, it will help you to always locate this anterior median fissure, which is kind of a deep depression on the anterior side of the spinal cord, as well as locating the dorsal root ganglion. So you can see here, we have a spinal nerve coming into the spinal cord, and then it splits into a dorsal root that is attached to the posterior side of the spinal cord, and a ventral root that comes out the front side of your spinal cord. And the dorsal root will always contain this little bulge called the dorsal root ganglion, which is a cluster of neuron cell bodies from that dorsal root. So if you're wondering, you know, how do I label which side is the posterior column or posterior horn, look for the dorsal root ganglion because that'll always be on the posterior side of your spinal cord. A couple more information about these dorsal root and ventral root. And then they will combine to form a spinal nerve. All sensory information comes into your spinal cord via the dorsal root. And so that's why you have a green arrow coming in the dorsal side. And all um, motor information, whether it's autonomic or somatic motor information, will always leave the spinal cord via the ventral root. So sensory information comes in the posterior side and um, motor information comes out the ventral or front side of those ventral roots. So the reflex itself, we'll kind of tie these two together now. It's an involuntary reaction in response to a stimulus applied to your periphery and transmitted to the central nervous system, your spinal cord. The simplest reflex is the stretch reflex, which occurs when muscles will contract in response to a stretching force applied to them. And the knee jerk reflex is the, or also known as the patellar reflex, when the doctor hammers your patellar tendon and your leg kicks out or jerks. That's a very classic example of a stretch reflex. And I'll show you a picture of that reflex. Here's another type of reflex called the withdrawal reflex. It's to remove a limb or another body part from a painful stimulus. And this type of reflex is what I described to you. If you were to touch a hot stove or step on a um, piece of glass, you automatically, your body automatically kind of withdraws itself away from that painful stimulus. The sensory receptors are pain receptors and stimulation of these receptors will initiate an immediate reflex response. So here we have a picture of the withdrawal reflex. Stepping on looks like a tack, which does not look fun. So obviously this will cause you pain. The pain receptors 
uh, in the sensory neuron are kind of that first kind of step in the reflex or the first component. The sensory neurons will conduct an action potential to the spinal cord. So you see this sensory neuron coming into the spinal cord. You can see here it's coming into the spinal cord via the dorsal root. The sensory neurons will synapse or connect with an interneuron um, within the spinal cord. And then that interneuron connects with a motor neuron, which exits out of the spinal cord via the ventral root usually to some sort of muscle or flexor muscle to try to withdraw the body part from the painful stimulus. So this is an example of the withdrawal reflex. So your spinal nerves we talked about, they arise from your spinal cord and they form when the dorsal root comes together with the ventral root. Spinal nerves will contain axons of both sensory and somatic neurons Spinal nerves come out of your spinal cord between vertebrae, and they're all categorized by the region of the vertebral column from which it emerges. So for example, the C1 spinal nerve comes off at the C1 vertebra region. So you have 31 pairs of spinal nerves, and we organize them into kind of uh, branching or groupings called plexuses. The cervical plexus or group of spinal nerves will contain spinal nerves C1 to 4, and the cervical plexus innervates all the muscles that are attached to your hyoid bone as well as your neck, not NECA. Um, and they, the cervical plexus will also contain the phrenic nerve, which innervates the diaphragm. And sometimes this is a good test question. What nerve innervates the diaphragm? It's your phrenic nerve. In cases of polio, which happened years ago, polio um, paralyzed the phrenic nerve, which paralyzed your diaphragm. So kids with polio weren't able to breathe well on their own, and they were put in these iron lung machines that helped increase and decrease the thoracic cavity and pressure so that they could breathe. Sometimes they would spend hours in an iron lung machine, if not, if their diaphragm wasn't completely paralyzed, other kids had to spend their whole life in this iron lung machine. So the polio vaccine helped a lot with that. Uh, the brachial plexus is another group of spinal nerves that comes together from spinal nerve C5 to T1, and they supply all your nerves to your upper limb, your shoulder, and your hand. The lumbosacral plexus is formed from spinal nerves L1 to S4, and they supply nerves to all of your lower limbs. So when I talk about plexuses, this is what I'm meaning here. Um, so here we have C1 to C4. So I'm just gonna put a little check mark, one, two, three, four. So these first spinal nerves kind of come together to form this network of nerves called a plexus. And from this network, different nerves then branch off from it. And plexuses are really important because if we have a whole kind of branching system of nerves being formed from four spinal nerves, um, and then you have an, one nerve kind of being a branch off of them, if you have any damage to C1 or C2 or C3 or C4, you might not lose complete control of the part of the body that's controlling your arm or, or your biceps muscle, for example, because if you have damage to C2, your C1 nerve might still work, um, and that would still provide innervation to this nerve that's formed from a plexus. So plexuses give an extra added level of protection um, to the nervous system and controlling parts of the body. Here are the spinal nerves forming the brachial plexus, um, the lumbosacral plexus, we kind of divide into a lumbar and a sacral plexus by themselves, and then the coccygeal plexus. A dermatone, um, so your nerves arise from each region of your spinal cord and the vertebral column, and they su supply a specific region of the body. And a dermatome specifically is the area of skin supplied with sensory innervation by a pair of spinal nerves. And each of your spinal nerves, except your C1, has a specific cutaneous sensory distribution. So this is what a dermatome looks like. Dermatomes describe the regions of the body on the skin. So this is just cutaneous sensory innervation. So these are the different dermatomes in the body that have sensory innervation 
to your skin receptors. Meaning that if you are, you know, testing someone's skin receptors for their L4 spinal nerve, for example, you would maybe take a brush, you know, or a pin and try to touch the lower leg on the inside. If that person can't feel it, you know, there's some sort of sensory problem with their L4 spinal nerve. If you try to touch the back of their calf, you know, in this S2 dermatome, and they're able to feel that, well, you know that sensory information is still okay in their S2 spinal nerve. So these dermatomes are just showing which, you know, skin areas are being supplied by a specific spinal nerve, and it's just great for a diagnostic tool. Then we'll go through parts of your brain stem. Um, so we're kind of going through your central nervous system first. We just kind of went through your spinal cord and now we'll go into your brain. Um, the brain stem are, is made up of these structures, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. So those are parts of the brain stem. So we're gonna kind of start there and then we'll work our way to the rest of the brain. The medulla oblongata is continuous with the spinal cord. So here's your medulla oblongata, and it will continue down as your spinal cord. It functions to do a lot of different um, stuff. It regulates your heart rate, blood vessel diameter, breathing, swallowing, vomiting, hiccuping, coughing, sneezing, and balance. And other functions is that it includes some pyramids within it. Pyramids are specific areas of your medulla that are involved in the conscious control of your skeletal muscle. The pons is located above the medulla, and I'm just going to show you. Here's your pons. It kind of is this rounded kind of circle region right above the medulla. So that's the pons. That's where we're going next. And then we'll end with this midbrain area. So I just want to kind of bring to your attention. We'll talk about pons and then the midbrain. And these are the three parts of your brain stem. The pons is right above the medulla. It's kind of like our bridge between the cerebrum and the cerebellum. So moving back to this picture, uh, the cerebrum itself is all of the brain tissue on the top. And your cerebellum is kind of another specific structure separated from the cerebrum um, that has different um, kind of purposes or functions than your cerebrum. So what this is saying is your pons, which again is the circular region, is kind of the connection piece between your cerebellum and your cerebrum above it. It will help to function in breathing, chewing, salivating, swallowing, and again, it works to kind of communicate and be that relay station between your cerebrum and cerebellum. The midbrain then is kind of the most uh, superior part of the brainstem. It functions to help coordinate your eye movements, the pupil diameter, turning your head toward a noise when you hear it. Um, we adopted a dog and we were so worried that he couldn't hear or see, but he does turn his head when he sees noise, kind of a tangent there. The other part or other kind of functions of the midbrain is that the dorsal part has four colliculi, which are little bodies which are involved in visual and auditory reflexes. So that is the brain stem. Reticular formation describes kind of more brain structures that are scattered throughout the brain stem. And they can be kind of scattered as different nuclei, different structures. And in general, whenever we talk about the reticular formation of the brainstem, all of their function kind of collectively includes regulating your cyclical motor function, respiration, which is breathing, walking, chewing, arousing, and maintaining consciousness. So kind of waking up, being able to stay awake as well as helping to regulate the sleep-wake cycle. So now we have the cerebellum, and here's a picture of your cerebellum. So this is what we're talking about next. Um, the cerebellum is this entire kind of area of brain tissue above the brainstem and diencephalon. The cerebellum is attached to the brainstem by what we call cerebellar peduncles. And, um, and I'm so sorry, I was describing you to the cerebrum. We're talking about the cerebellum. Let me go back. Um, the cerebellum, I'm so sorry, is back here. So here's your cerebellum located behind the brain stem. So we're going to go over that part first. Um, the cerebellum is attached to the brain stem by cerebellar peduncles, and it means little brain. Its cortex is composed of gyri, which are folds, 
sulky are it just indentations or depression, and then areas of gray matter. And your cerebellum is very important for controlling balance, muscle tone, and coordination of fine motor skills. So your cerebellum doesn't kind of, it doesn't start the action of controlling your skeletal muscles, but it helps to coordinate your muscles working together in a fine motor skill environment. So there is your cerebellum. The diencephalon, which is next. So again, if you're wondering where we're at, if you're confused already, we talked about the brain stem, the midbrain, the pons, the medulla oblongata. And now we're going to go over the diencephalon, which is kind of in the smack dab center of the brain. Uh, what makes up your diencephalon is your thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus. The thalamus is kind of the center part of the brain. It acts as kind of the filtering uh, station of all sensory material that comes into the brain. And the hypothalamus is located right here. Your hypothalamus helps to control some hormones that are being secreted from your pituitary gland. And the epithalamus we sometimes label in the back, which is not labeled here. Your epithalamus um, includes your pineal gland that helps regulate your sleep wake cycles with melatonin. So here's the thalamus, the largest portion of your diencephalon. It influences mood, it detects pain. The epithalamus is located right above your thalamus to help to detect emotional and visceral responses to odors. And the hypothalamus is located below the thalamus. And the big thing here is it controls your pituitary gland. And it's connected to the pituitary gland kind of by a stalk or a branch called your infundibulum. And these hormones um, that are being released from your pituitary gland will control homeostasis, body temperature, thirst, hunger, fear, rage, and all sexual emotions. So your hypothalamus helps to control all of the hormones that are controlling those functions. So here we have the diencephalon. Um, the, the thalamus, again, is this structure right here. You can see that it's kind of made of two halves. Within the thalamus, there's different clusters of what we call nuclei, and each region of nuclei has a different function. Um, the two halves of the thalamus are connected in the middle with the interthalamic adhesion. And then right below the thalamus, we have the hypothalamus. And you can see here how, how it's connected to your pituitary gland to release hormones. And then the epithalamus is located here, kind of right behind or above the thalamus and included in your epithalamus, um, you're responding to emotion, but also is the pineal gland, which helps to secrete melatonin to regulate your sleep and wake cycles. So that is your diencephalon. Cerebrum characteristics. So the cerebrum now is the largest portion of the brain. And we divide your brain into two hemispheres, the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere, um, which are separated right down the middle, kind of at the top of the head via the longitudinal fissure. And then we characterize the different lobes of your cerebrum as labeled here. And many of these lobes are named for the bone that they lie under. So your frontal lobe will be below your frontal bone, your forehead region. The parietal lobe will be on the sides of your cerebrum. The occipital lobe is in the back of the cerebrum. And the temporal lobe will be around where your ears would be for your temporal bone. We have different what we call fissures or sulcuses, sulci, which are divisions between the lobes. The central sulcus divides your parietal and your frontal lobe, and the lateral fissure kind of borders the temporal lobe out. So those are cerebrum characteristics. The cerebral cortex of your cerebrum is just the surface of the cerebrum. It's only a couple millimeters thick, and it's just the surface of the cerebrum. It's composed of gray matter, and it functions to control your thinking, communicating, remembering, understanding, and will initiate all of your involuntary movements. So things that happen without you knowing it. Cerebrum surface features, we have gyri, which are the folds of the cerebral cortex. Uh, the sulci, that's plural for sulcus, 
are shallow indentations and a fissure is a much deeper indentation. We have left and right hemispheres that control opposite sides of the body. Your left hemisphere controls the right side of the body and is responsible for math, analytical kind of processing and speech. And the right side of your body controls the left or the right hemisphere controls the left side of the body and is responsible for music, art, and abstract ideas. So you can decide for yourself right now if you are more right-brained or left-brained. The corpus callosum is the connection between the two hemispheres, and we'll show you a picture of that as well. Then the different lobes of the brain um, have all different functions. And if you ever want to go in and be a brain surgeon, you know, it's just amazing what the medical community has kind of discovered about the brain because they know exactly in each part of the brain what occurs. And to me, that just makes it really interesting. The frontal brain, the frontal lobe of the brain is located in the front, right below your frontal bone. And this lobe of the brain controls all voluntary motor functions. So what you can control, you know, movement to your skeletal muscles aggression, moods, and your smell. The parietal lobe is located on the top, kind of underneath your parietal bones, and it functions to evaluate all sensory input, like touch, pain, pressure, temperature, and taste. The occipital lobe is located in the back where your occipital bone would be, and it, its primary function is to um, process all vision and all vision impulses. So all the images that you are taking in right now are being processed in your occipital lobe. And the temporal lobe is on the sides by your ear, um, and it will help to function in hearing, smell, and memory. So those are the lobes of the brain. Here's another look at the cerebrum from kind of top down view showing the longitudinal fissure, which separates out the right hemisphere from the left hemisphere. And again, if you're more right-brained, you might have more of like an artistic, musical ability. Left-brained people are a little more kind of math, science, analytical. The gyri are located, you can see here, um, the gyri themselves are different folds of the brain. And then when you see a sulci, a sulcus is just kind of a depression or a separation between gyri. And the main sulcus we characterize is called the central sulcus. Um, and the central sulcus just separates out your frontal lobe from your parietal lobe, as shown there. Here's another look at the cerebrum, describing again the lobes. Here's your frontal lobe, temporal lobe, um, the cerebellum, again, is separated. It works with balance and equilibrium, but it's completely separate from the rest of the cerebrum, occipital lobe, and parietal lobe, again. Sensory functions, so your central nervous system your brain and spinal cord are constantly receiving sensory input. We are unaware of most of what happens. So your brain is kind of taking care of things inside of your body, as well as outside of the body. It's helping to regulate temperature without us even knowing it. Sensory input is vital to our survival and normal functions because there might be something that's going on inside of your body. You might be fighting off an infection or a disease. Your body digestive tract is trying to break down the pancakes and eggs you ate for breakfast, that all that sensory input goes to your brain and then your brain controls the function of that without us even knowing. Your heart rate, your heart rate might be increasing right now because you're nervous about all this information you have to learn or your heart rate may, may, be, may, may be very slow right now because you're totally bored and this is just too much to take in. So heart rate, breathing, respiratory rate, pH, all of that is controlled by your brain and spinal cord. Ascending tracks are sensory tracks that carry all of that sensory information and impulses up your spinal cord to the specific part of the brain that needs to process it. Each ascending tract will be involved with a limited type of sensory input like pain, temperature, touch, position, or pressure. And tracks are usually given a composite name that indicates their origin and, and termination. So for example, a name of a, an ascending tract usually begins with the prefix spino because it will begin in the spinal cord. 
And an example of this is the spinothalamic tract. It will begin in the spinal cord and end in the thalamus. The sensory tract itself typically will cross from one side of the body to the other, either in the spinal cord or the brainstem. And as we kind of mentioned before, the left side of your body or the brain, excuse me, receives all sensory input from the right side of your body and vice versa. So your left side of the body or the brain, excuse me, receives sensory information from the right side of the body and vice versa because these spinal cord tracts will cross over. So here we have an example showing your ascending spinal cord tracts. Because these are tracts, we're talking about white matter. So tracts in the dorsal column, the lateral column and the anterior column. And then we have different tracts depending on where they are. We have the posterior spinocerebellar tract, which begins in the spinal cord and ends in the cerebellum, an anterior spinocerebellar tract and then an anterior spinothalamic tract, which will start in the spinal cord and end in your thalamus. So those are tracts bringing all sensory information to the brain. Here's a look at the dorsal column um, tract showing how a sensory receptor enters into the spinal cord in the dorsal column. It travels up to your medulla where it crosses over to the other side and then goes up to that part of the brain um, that will kind of figure out what that receptor is sensing. Sensory areas of your cerebral cortex. So we're talking about your cerebral cortex, which is the very thin layer of gray matter on your cerebrum. We have primary sensory areas where ascending tracts will project their information and where sensations are perceived. And we have a primary somatic sensory cortex, which is the general sensory area in your parietal lobe that takes in all sensory inputs like pain, pressure, and temperature. Any sort of somatic motor function that occurs, remember a somatic motor function innervates skeletal muscles, and your somatic motor system is responsible for all of your skeletal muscles, which maintain your body's posture, balance, moving your trunk, your head, your limbs, your tongue, your eyes, as well as communicating through facial expressions and speech. All these somatic motor functions, any reflex that will be mediated or started through the spinal cord and brainstem will be responsible for some of these body movements that are involuntary, like quickly flexing your arm to remove it from a painful, painful source, but voluntary movements will be consciously activated, like achieving a goal, like walking or typing or writing or taking a sip of water or coffee. The voluntary movements result from the, the stimulation of neural circuits that consist of two motor neurons, an upper and a lower motor neuron. And these upper and lower motor neurons um, each have cell bodies in different parts of this nervous system. Upper motor neurons have cell bodies in the cerebral cortex, which is in the brain, and there they will project down the spinal cord to synapse or connect with the lower motor neuron. Lower motor neurons have cell bodies in the anterior horn of your spinal cord gray matter, or in cranial nerve nuclei. And what this is just showing is how these upper and lower motor neurons will communicate with each other to produce a skeletal muscle response. So axons of lower motor neurons leave the central nervous system and will extend through your spinal or cranial nerves to your skeletal muscles themselves. And here are the motor areas of your cerebral cortex. We talked about how the sensory areas are in the parietal lobe. The primary motor cortex is in your frontal lobe, so right behind your forehead, which controls all of our voluntary motor movement. We have a premotor area where motor functions are organized before they start, and a prefrontal area where you have a motivation and a foresight to plan and initiate a movement. So all of what I just talked about, kind of the last six slides, can be kind of summed up with this picture. So this is showing you the cerebral cortex, which again is just the thin superficial layer of your cerebrum. And this, these colors show you which areas are sensory areas and which areas are motor areas. And the somatic sensory association area 
will be in the parietal lobe along with the primary somatic sensory cortex. So your parietal lobe includes all sensory information, the primary motor cortex and the primary motor in the premotor area, the prefrontal area, these all include kind of motor control. We have other areas of the brain that are taste areas, visual association areas, visual cortex, sensory speech areas, auditory association areas, auditory cortex, and motor speech areas. But in general, if you can kind of remember that the parietal lobe in, um, kind of controls or per perceives and receives all sensory information, and your frontal lobe controls all motor kind of somatic voluntary responses with these other areas also shown here. Your brain is an incredible organ and just kind of appreciate what the medical community has done to figure out what each part of the brain does. This is really helpful in diagnosing if you have a brain tumor, for example, and you only have problem um, kind of being able to form or think through the words that you're saying. You might have a brain tumor in the sensory speech area. If you have a problem associating auditory or sounds together, you might have a brain tumor in the auditory association tumor in, in area. So um, again, knowing what each part of the brain does is important for diagnosing problems and staying healthy too. So ascending tracks bring information to the brain. Descending tracks will always be motor tracks carrying an impulse down the spinal cord. They will either terminate there in the spinal cord or in the brain stem. We can have corticospinal tracks, which are direct tracks because they extend directly from an upper motor neuron to a lower motor neuron. Or we can have what we call an indirect tract because they originate in the brain stem, but they're indirectly controlled by your cerebral cortex, basal nuclei, or cerebellum. Tracks in your lateral columns are most important in controlling goal-directed limb movements like reaching for something or manipulating something like tying your shoes. And tracks in the ventral columns, um, such as the reticulospinal tract, are most important for maintaining posture, balance, and limb position through the control of your neck, trunk, and all of your proximal limb muscles. And we probably won't finish this whole thing today. I know this is a lot of information. I'm going to go for about five more minutes and then we'll pause. Um, these descending tracks also cross over so that the left side of your brain controls skeletal muscles on the right side of the body. So, you know, information coming from your brain down to your body will cross over so that one side of the brain controls the opposite side of the body and vice versa. And these are where your descending tracks are located, again, within parts of your white matter of the spinal cord. Here's the direct motor tract where an upper level motor neuron will directly kind of connect with a lower motor neuron. So that's considered a direct motor tract. When we talk about nuclei throughout the brain, these are groups of functionally related nuclei. So think of cell bodies with their nucleus and neurons, and they're all functionally related to each other. They all help to plan, organize, and coordinate motor movements and posture. We have a kind of a group of nuclei called the corpus striatum, a substantia nigra. Um, these are where they're located kind of within the brain itself and how they're related to the thalamus. And again, you know, we describe these groups of nuclei. These are just groups of nervous tissue or nerve cells that are functionally controlling kind of a similar part of the body. So those are nuclei. Speech, for example, is mainly controlled in your left hemisphere. Uh, the sensory speech area, also known as the Wernicke's area, again, named after the guy who probably discovered it, um, is located in the parietal lobe where words are heard and comprehended. So the kind of the sensation of speech and the motor speech area, also known as the Broca's area, is found in your frontal lobe. And this is where words are formulated. So if you can think through the words that you want to say, but your mouth, you can't formulate those words, you have a problem in the Broca's area. If you hear words or um, you're, you're, you're speaking just gibberish, 
um, that means that your words are not being heard and com comprehended. So that would be a sensory speech problem. So that is speech and the different parts of speech, sensory or motor and where it's located. Uh, brain waves and consciousness, we can determine kind of your brain activity using an electroencephalogram. And these are used to diagnose and determine a treatment for a brain disorder. An EEG electroencephalogram are when we put electrodes on someone's brain or their scalp to record all the brain's electrical activity. And this can be really important. We can identify different waves of electrical activity. Alpha waves will be perceived when the person is awake but quiet. Beta waves will be when that person is going through intense mental activity, maybe um, kind of thinking through a problem, taking an exam. Delta waves will be perceived in deep sleep, and theta waves is a specific wave found only in children. And I think there is a question on brain waves on your next um, lecture exam. So this is a look at the electrodes being placed on someone's scalp, the electroencephalogram, and the different types of waves and how they might be read or look on a chart. So those are different brain waves. Memory is really interesting, and we start with memory by describing what encoding is. And encoding is a brief retention of a sensory input that's received by the brain while something is scanned, evaluated, and acted up. This is also called your sensory memory, and this is located in your temporal lobe, and it lasts for less than a second. So that what, that's what encoding is. Consolidated memory um, or consolidated, it means this is data that has been encoded and it's stored in your temporal lobe as short-term memory. Storage refers to long-term memory um, that's usually a long-term memory from either a few minutes ago or a permanent memory. And depending on the storage of a long-term memory, it depends how often you retrieve that memory and think of it. So for example, if you're trying to remember something from you know, an hour ago, if you don't think about it or you remind yourself again or write it down, you'll probably forget it. But you can permanently remember things, especially things from your childhood that maybe had an impact on you. Unfortunately, sometimes those are negative memories that unfortunately you remember the most, but even um, learning how to ride a bike your first time or a family vacation, you know, if you think about, if you think about the memory often, then it's more likely to go in your long-term memory storage. Um, and that's why usually, you know, post-traumatic stress disorders, things that were really traumatic in your life, sometimes are placed in your long-term memory because it's hard to forget, unfortunately, the bad times. And then retrieval is how we just describe how often we retrieve that information or we use it. So um, yeah, that's retrieval. Types of memory, short-term memory are usually um, information that's retained for a few seconds or a few minutes. So short-term memory are just small bits of information, usually seven or less. So if you're talking to an elderly person or even not anyone elderly, someone with short-term memory loss, or it's just hard for them to remember things from a couple minutes ago, um, they would think this is short-term memory. Long-term memory can last for a few minutes or permanently. So we often think of long-term memory as you know, things that happened years ago. The long-term memory technically includes anything that lasts maybe 10 minutes, you know, if that happened 10 minutes ago or an hour ago. An episodic memory is remembering kind of places or events or episodes. And learning means that you can utilize past memories um, to learn information. And that's where you guys come in with learning the material for class. Learning specifically means utilizing a past memory of where you heard a bit of information before. And learning means you use it over and over again so that it goes into your, hopefully your short-term or your long-term memory. The limbic system is another kind of system of the brain. Um, which includes the olfactory cortex in certain deep cortical regions and nuclei and the diencephalon. It's all grouped together to include what we call the limbic system. And your limbic system is kind of the, the whole system that influences your long-term declarative memory, your emotions. So if you can tie limbic system with emotions to remember that,
your visceral responses to emotions, your motivation, and your mood. These are all kind of parts of your limbic system. And a major source of sensory input to your limbic system are olfactory nerves. So the sense of smell really dictates your emotion and your memory. The limbic system will be connected to the hypothalamus, which helps to control hormones. And if you have a lesion, and that just means some sort of damage to your limbic system, that can result in a voracious appetite, an increased or perverse sexual activity, docility, so being very docile, um, so including a loss of a normal fear and an anger response. So this would be any damage to your limbic system. And here's a look at the limbic system. It kind of is a conglomerate system that uses different nuclei, different body, different nervous tissue. It includes olfaction. And just try to remember limbic system is connected with emotions. Okay, and I think with that, we will pause there with meninges. So I'll remember that place. Um, I'm gonna pause there because I think you have plenty to go over. Um, for those of you who are wondering, you know, how we're doing with, with your schedule, if you kind of joined us a little late, we're finishing up part two of your nervous system in chapter eight, and we still have to get through chapter nine, which will be senses. Depending on how long that takes, um, you know, we will not have a lecture exam on Monday, which is the seventh, possibly Wednesday, uh, but I'll keep you posted when your next lecture exam will be, but it will not be next Monday, which is March 7th. Um, but what is correct in your syllabus is we'll maintain the same lab schedule. So today with lab, we'll have your second lab exam on exercises seven, eight, and nine, and then Monday you'll have your lab exam for that. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording there and then I'll answer any questions.